turn your hymnals again to number 29, Wonderful Words of Life. Number 29, Wonderful Words of Life. And I think you ought to stand. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty, beautiful words. Wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of life. Listen well to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All the wondrous story showing us his glory, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, Wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call. Wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace for all. Wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify. Sanctify forever, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, because I'm new, I don't know everything certainly very well at all, but is there special music this morning? Is somebody doing special music? Luke, did you want to step in and do special music? <laughs> Just checking, don't want to. Okay, all right. Pastor, I'll turn it over to you. Let's pray together. God. Thank you for the privilege of uh, being able to open up the pages of your book. We have just sung of your word, and we say amen to the fact that they are wonderful words. They are beautiful words. They are indeed the words of life. But wow, are we at a special place in your word. And I guess I've already prayed it, but reiterate for emphasis that you would open our eyes and help us to behold all the wonders of your word. That's our prayer. We pray it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Our study in Genesis continues. We have just entered chapter 22. Oh, folks, may we be among those who tremble at God's word. I just came across that biblical phrase devotionally again, and Every time I read that, and it's there a number of times in the scriptures, I am remi reminded of how far away I am from the perspective of God's people regarding the word of God in the past. May we be among those who tremble at his word. May we stand in awe of what transpires here in Genesis 22, and as I often state, may God write every detail on the fleshly tablets of our hearts. 
pausing at the beginning to recognize with you that this is the pinnacle of Abraham's faith. If you've been with us, we started with his small faith. But now, it's large. I would say to you that this is a man in full faith. And I would recognize with you in saying so that that's a rare thing. I don't think we see that very often, a man in full faith. I want to be one, but I know that I probably am not. God help me in regard to that, but Abraham is. Again, we're standing on holy ground. Spent our time last week in verse 1. I won't apologize uh, to you through the course of this, um, th- this part of our study of Genesis where we are going low and slow through this classic text. I have already discovered that we've covered too much turf. But rather than backtracking, I am being a good boy and proceeding. We spent our time last week in verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did test Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. This morning, verse 2. Take a look as I read. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. I'm afraid that we have misinterpreted, misunderstood what God here says to Abraham. I'm afraid that we have misjudged God's motive behind saying to Abraham, take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. It's almost as if we picture God as a nasty older brother who has snatched his younger sister's favorite doll and is threatening to dispose of her. And he says, I've got your favorite doll. I've, I've got Susie Q. I've got the doll that you love. And she's about to go bye-bye. And the little girl, no! Is God rubbing it in? Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, I want you to take Isaac, the one that you so much love. We, of course, know better than that. But what is God doing here? What is this in verse 2? Well, I'd like you to explore two things with me. There's more, but two things. God is doing two things here in verse 2. First of all, this is a huge faith booster. This is absolutely masterful. And again, we've misunderstood this. We have misread, I am certain of this. What God does here with Abraham is the exact opposite of rubbing it in. Again, it's masterful. And it relates to God solidifying Abraham's great faith. I've proposed to you that we are finding Abraham here in full faith. Yes, indeed. 
But what God says to Abraham here bolsters that. God isn't here seeking to shake Abraham's faith. God has the right to do that, by the way, and there's probably places that we could turn where, where uh, clearly God is, is testing. And in fact, we know, and this is interesting, part of the reason why i got to pursue this with you, we know that God here overall is testing Abraham. This is a test. It is only a test. As he instructs Abraham to take his only beloved and begotten son Isaac and offer him as a burnt offering. By the way, apart from a miracle, no one's coming back from that. We'll say more about this next week, but the sacrifice is completely consumed. But again, we, we know something that Abraham does not know, and that is this is a test, it's only a test. And it'd be easy for us to read through what God says here in verse 2 and figure that that's directly related to the test, that God is, is continuing to expand the aspects of the test. And in that sense, I guess, if that were the proper perspective on this, we would have to say, yes, God is rubbing it in a little bit. But there's a different perspective, and I'm offering it to you this morning humbly, even though I'm a bit fired up about it. God isn't seeking to shake Abraham's faith here at this last second, the last moment of the, uh, of the scenario. Rather, he is saying what he needs to say in order for Abraham's full faith to be solidified, not shaken, solidified. God is, in a gracious and merciful way, setting Abraham up for being successful in regard to the test. Let me tell you what I mean. God masterfully, yet succinctly, walks. Only God could do it like this. The succinctness. God masterfully yet succinctly walks Abraham through his faith journey. It takes about, I didn't time it out, or I mean it's just a few sentences right, literally seconds that God takes to rehearse Abraham's faith journey that has lasted for 25 years. And just before... Abraham is to act on the divine instruction to sacrifice his son as a burnt offering. God pauses and succinctly walks Abraham through his 25-year faith journey. And I want to say a word about that, but I, I want to note with you, I guess we've done this before, but I'm reiterating, then I want to note with you the means within which, the means that God uses, the means within which God accomplishes that. Walking Abraham through his faith journey. The means that God employs for that, I would call patient, persistent clarification. If you've been with us in regard to our study of Genesis, especially since chapter 12, where we meet up with who will become the great Old Testament patriarch Abraham, you have been impressed with God's patient and persistent clarification with Abraham. And we see that by way of summary here in verse 2. God initially says to Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you a seed. And Abraham, you recall, he says, well, can my servant, the one born in my household, Eliezer, can Eliezer be it? Do you recall that class? All two of you? But God, again, with his patient and persistent clarification, he, he says 
to Abraham, no, it's not Eliezer. The son will come from your own loins. And then, of course, we have the Hagar fiasco, right? And Abraham then says to God, oh, that Ishmael will live before you. And again, God, patient and persistent clarification, says, no, it's not Ishmael. The promised son will come not only from your loins, but also from Sarah's womb. You and Sarah in your old age will bear the promised son, and you will call him Isaac. God says, I've even got his name for you. Now plug that in. Listen very carefully to what I'm doing with you now. Plug that into verse 2. God says, take now thy son, the servant Eliezer will not do. God says, take now thy son, Eliezer will not do, thine only son, Ishmael will not do, the son of Hagar the handmaid will not do. Take now thy son, Eliezer will not do. Take now thine only son, Ishmael will not do. You take Isaac, and Isaac alone. He even names him so that there would be no question as to who was in view. And then God says, the one you love. We're just starting to sense this, I think, from, from a fullness standpoint, that there was a special covenantal, listen, I, the, the word is significant, there was a special covenantal bond between Abraham and the promised son. I would venture to say to you that it's love that cannot be reached apart from a covenant. And so there's a second thing. I sure wish I knew if you follow all that because wow was I excited about it and man am I disappointed that perhaps you did not. But God's getting pretty used to my disappointments. There's a second thing God is doing here. It's in response. It's in response to God citing Abraham's unique and special love for Isaac. What I'm about to say to you, you will see more fully as our study unfolds, but this is a gracious invitation by God for Abraham to enter into the sphere of God the Father's love for his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham's experience here is taking him closer to what Calvary was like for God the Father and God the Son. Again, Genesis 22 is the type. Calvary is the antitype. I hinted at it last week. I'm making it an actual proposal this week, and I believe it will be proven in the weeks to come. Calvary was as hard on and as costly to God the Father as it was God the Son. The skeptic is unconscious of the fact that you and I have been rescued from the condemnation of our sin by the triune God. 
and even God's people have made the mistake of figuring that it was Christ and Christ only with a view to the Godhead that paid. I can tell you, and it's not about me, that a father can die a thousand deaths and in measure we see that here with father Abraham and his only begotten and beloved son Isaac I observed with you last week that Abraham doesn't offer Isaac before he offers himself God here am I. But I think it runs deeper than that. A father, a good father, a loving father would gladly take the place of his son with a view to any kind of suffering. In fact, we would take the place without hesitation even when wisdom would say no. And a father, a good one, without hesitation, would offer his life up for his son. You can be assured that that's Abraham's heartbeat here. And oh, what a difference the story would be if Abraham was operating strictly on his heart, his own heart. And on a human plane, I would actually propose that the suffering may run deeper and be more prolonged for the father above the son. Think about that with Abraham here. Remember, this is only a test, but Abraham does not know that. There's a four-day block of time when Abraham, and Abraham alone, silently bears the burden of what God was asking him to do. We know that Isaac doesn't know because Isaac, in verse 7, as you know from our scripture reading, at one juncture looks to his dad, calls his name, and says, Dad, where is the sacrifice? Where is the offering? And Abraham, of course, says, God will provide. Isaac doesn't know. And uh, you may even get a kick out of this. I am certain that Sarah doesn't know. I'm certain that if Abraham would have shared the plan with Sarah, Abraham and Isaac would have had to have left over her dead body. Do not mess with Mama Bear's cub. I get a kick out of our church, you know, that you would think, and of course you know I'm just a wimpy fellow anyways, but most people would think, you know, boy, if I was going to be afraid of anybody, it would be the men of the church, especially those that are so much bigger than me. But no, it's Mama Bear. We give her a wide berth. So Isaac doesn't know. Sarah doesn't know. And for four days, Abraham dies. Because he knows. Part of the reason why I pursue that with you is because of the bum rap that God the Father, that God the Father gets, not only in directing Abraham here to sacrifice his son Isaac, but more so the bum rap that God the Father gets in actually sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, his only beloved and begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to Calvary. Again, Genesis 22, the type, Calvary, the fulfillment of the type. 
I was going to say to you that the skeptic in scorn refers to biblical Christianity as the bloody religion. But more and more, just so that you know, the men and women that are mounting the pulpit of today's churches are declaring the same. Progressive Christianity, son. The emergent church that looks at Calvary and dubs it cosmic child abuse. God placing his son on the cross and striking him. And the fact of the matter is we know from Isaiah 53 that that's exactly what took place. God indeed did strike Christ. That's the reason why we are saved today. But what he misses, and it's the whole kit and caboodle, is the suffering of the Father. And again, we're talking about the triune God. I, we have no choice but to think of it from a human standpoint because that's what we are. And we recognize that we're finite and we're trying to understand and ultimately embrace the infinite. But listen, we need to remember that it's the triune God. We need to be careful about separating what cannot be separated in, in regard to the personages of the Godhead and think that only one suffers while the other does not. I was just thinking of this, by the way, this morning. I wonder what kind of suffering the Holy Spirit of God experienced at Calvary. I mean, listen, if he's grieved by a single one of our sins, then what kind of suffering when the second personage takes on the sins of the whole wide world and in turn is struck for them? The, the skeptic says that Christianity is the unnecessarily bloody religion. But the truth is, there is no salvation from sin apart from what transpired there on Calvary's cross as Christ dies for the sins of the world. So I'd say to you, if you're here this morning within the sound of this voice and you have not yet trusted Christ, please know this. This is why there can only be one Savior. This has happened only one time in space and time. History. At a point in time when Christ took on the penalty of the sins of the world and bore them so that we wouldn't have to. So I plead with you to be saved. And then doesn't this spur us on, those who have trusted Christ, being reminded of the special and unique love, the covenantal love between a father and his son, where they would go together and do all that needed to be done in order for righteousness to be established. Oh, make sure you're saved today, and if not, I would plead with you to make today the day of your salvation, and then, oh, child of God, how our hearts ought to be stirred on to sacrificial service for this one who loved us and gave himself for us. Lord, thank you for these considerations. Again, we're going slow and low through Genesis 22 in part because 
we have biblical warrant for seeing a whole nother scene. And we're not questioning the realness, the authenticity, the historicity of the text. We, we're not questioning whether Abraham and Isaac existed. We're not questioning whether you instructed by way of test Abraham regarding offering his son Isaac. We're not questioning the details of the narrative. And oh, how our hearts and minds are moved by this Old Testament patriarch and his son. And yet more and more we will see how it directly points to another father and another son. May we continue to walk with you through this. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our hymnals and turn to number 458, 458. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. We'll sing the fourth verse as the final verse, final song. Fourth verse, 458, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Stem. Take my 